All right, good morning and welcome to City on a Hill. Thanks for joining us this morning on uh, our online service. We're kind of getting used to this. Um, there are a couple things we want you to know about us if you're joining us for the first time. And that is, number one, that we are a Bible-believing church. We believe that the Bible is inspired from the first chapter all the way to the last. And because of that, we believe that the only way to have a relationship with the God of heaven is through his son, Jesus Christ. And so those are two pillars that we want you to know that, that we stand on. Uh, here as a church. Um, if you are new to us, we would love for you to uh, go to the website at the bottom of the page here and fill out a card um, to let us know that you joined us this morning. And then also uh, you'll find the sermon notes on that. So if you want to pause the video right now and pull those up on your phone, that would be helpful. All right, before I get started, I am going to uh, make one quick announcement, and that is that starting on Saturday, May 16th, and we're going to meet at 7 o'clock in the morning, uh, we are going to have a men's Bible study um, called Kingdom Men, and it's with Dr. Tony Evans, who's an outstanding teacher, and we hope that lots of you guys will get signed up for that. There, again, at the, at the website there, you're going to be able to go and get signed up, and then we also have, uh, we're asking that all of the men who are going to be a part of this order their own book, and there's a link if, if, when you sign up. Uh, it's a $13 book. I just did it today. You can order it, and it'll get sent right to your house so that you have it for the study. All right, so with that being said, uh, open your Bibles, if you would, please, to Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to read what's probably going to be a familiar uh, passage for some of you, but I want you to go to Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, and this is going to kind of be our jumping off point this morning. This is Jesus talking. He says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who has built his house in the sand. 
the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. See, any of us who have been around for any amount of time understand that in this world, in this life, we've been through trials. We're currently going through a trial right now, kind of collectively, if you, when you think about this pandemic, and we know that there will be trials that come in the future. And so what Jesus says here is we have a choice. You can choose to build your house on the foundation of the rock, and when storms come, you have a solid foundation on which to stand, or you can build your house on the sinking sands or the shifting sands of this world. And when the storms of this world come, you have a lot less of a chance of standing up against it. And so that leads us into our life point. We're going to get right into that this morning. Our life point this morning is that as Christians, we need a plan as we come out of this shelter-in-place time that allows us to build our house on the rock of Christ and not on the shifting sands of the world. So let me say that again. As you come out of this shelter-in-place we need to have a plan as we move forward, and we're going to talk about what I mean by that as we go through the lesson. But we need to have a plan that's going to help us to build our house on the, the solid rock of Christ versus the shifting sands of the world. So with that being said, let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Father God, we love you. Uh, we thank you for your word. We thank you that because of your word, we can have a solid foundation. We thank you that we don't have to be tossed back and forth with every storm that comes. But because of your word, because of your son, we can have a foundation that we can build ourselves on and we can withstand the storms of this world. We ask, Lord, that you would speak to us through your word and through this teaching this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So one of the things that is so important for us to remember is that regardless of what's happening in our lives, regardless of the storms that we may or may not be going through, God is in control and God is sovereign. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, Steve preached on that point exactly when he was talking about uh, Isaac and Rebecca and Jacob and Esau. And there were lots of different things, lots of different trials that they were going through. But throughout it all, God was sovereign and God was in control. So if God is in control, this begs an interesting question that is sometimes very difficult for people to answer. If God is in control, then why, are there, why is there suffering and evil and trials in this world? If God is in control, why do those things even exist? Now, I have to tell you, I, am, I, do, I approach this subject very, with, with some apprehension because this is a very difficult question to answer. But it's also one that I think if we are loving God with all of our minds, like we're going to talk about in a little bit, it's one that's really important for us to tackle. One of the major arguments out there against Christianity is the fact that there is evil and suffering if this, in this world. And the argument goes something like this. If God is all-powerful, if God is all-loving, then why does he allow evil, why does he allow suffering, why does he allow trials in this world? And it's a fair question. But I think there are some really good answers to it. And I think as Christians, it's important for us as part of loving God with all of our mind that we dive into the answers to those questions. Now, I say that, and I don't, the, the main point of my message this morning is not to answer the question, why is there evil and suffering? But we're going to talk about six different points. And I took these from uh, one of Jay Warner Wallace's videos on Right Now Media, which, by the way, if you're not using, you need to tap into that. It's an outstanding resource for us. But it's, it's, he has uh, eight videos that go along with his book called God's Crime Scene. And one of those videos, and we've been watching this as a family, in one of those videos, he talks about this, this struggle with why is there evil and suffering in this world. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of paraphrase, but I'm going to give you six points this morning. And the last one that we're going to talk about, I hope, is going to kind of launch us into the challenge that I'm going to give you that was part of our life point about building your house on the rock of Christ. The first thing that J. Warner Wallace talks about is he says, in order to reconcile evil and suffering and trials in this world, you have to have an understanding of free agency or free choice. And what that means is basically we were created by God to have a loving relationship with him. But love requires freedom. If we were just made to love God, then we're nothing more than robots and we are simply doing what we were programmed to do. But true love requires freedom. And in order to have freedom, freedom requires that there is a choice for good and evil. So sometimes we choose good, and sometimes we choose evil. So one of the ways that we can reconcile why there is evil and suffering in this world is free choice. The second thing that we can, that we can look at is the idea of having the proper 
understanding of eternity. So I want to give you this example. If you, if you think of your life, and it's, this is the starting point, this is when you're born, and this is the ending point, and this is where just everything ends, and this is when you die, and you think as a, you know, you're, you're kind of guaranteed or you should be um, given 85 to 90, 90 years of healthy living and, and relatively low amount of trials and suffering, and if that happens, you're satisfied. If anything happens in, that, in the interim there, and your life is cut short by an accident or um, something else, a disease, something happens, you feel like you've been robbed, and this is now considered evil. But if we look at this as not the end, but instead we've got a starting point, and then we go off into eternity, so instead of being a line segment, we're actually a line ray where it has a starting point, and then it goes off into eternity. When you can see things in light of eternity, it takes the pain and suffering and puts it into perspective. Let me give you another example. Uh, we have a, I have a coworker at school, and when they were having their first child, uh, their son was born with a hole in his heart. And so in the, within the first week of his life, he was in Ann Arbor and they were having heart surgery. If you had talked to them in that first week, they would have said, this is terrible, this is evil, this is, look at all the suffering that we're going through. And it would have been very difficult to make sense of what that was. And now he's a 17-year-old boy. He's ha happy, healthy, he's well-adjusted. And if you look back now, that was a very small blip on the radar. And not only that, but it was a very necessary thing that he had to go through in order to be happy, healthy, and well-adjusted. And so that's a small example. That's 17 years later, and you can, you can look back and see it. Think about in terms of eternity. Whatever we're going through in this life, whatever storm or trial that we're in, when you, can, when you understand that in light of eternity, it makes things a lot easier to reconcile. So free choice, having a proper understanding of, of eternity. The third thing is that we understand the evil and suffering and trials, can under, we understand that those can sometimes lead to or often lead to character development. James chapter 1, verse 2 says it this way, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kind, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be made mature and complete, not lacking anything. See, we understand this. If you're a parent, you certainly get this. You don't want to see your kids go through all kinds of pain, but you understand that struggle is good for them. You understand that when they have to work really hard for something, it's developing character. And sometimes in our lives, when we are going through trials or we're going through different things, different storms of this life, it is in fact developing character. Look at the contrast between these things. These are things that we hope that we have ourselves, and these are things that we hope our kids have if we have kids, but they also require the opposite. For example, courage requires danger. Compassion requires some sort of suffering. Forgiveness requires evil. And charity requires poverty. So you can see when we, when we go through these tough times, when we go through these trials, when we go through these storms, it has a lot to do with developing our character. So we've got free will, we've got understanding uh, in light of eternity, and then we've got character development. The fourth thing, that we, the reason that we can kind of reconcile even, evil and suffering is that there are times when evil and suffering comes as a result of a consequence. If you go back to that free choice, there are times when we make choices that lead to some sort of consequence. And so it's not necessarily evil. It may fe feel evil. It's certainly suffering. It can certainly lead to trials, but it's because of our own choice. The fifth thing is that evil and suffering can be reconciled if we acknowledge that we as human beings have a limited understanding. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says it this way, My thoughts are not your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you can imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. In other words, God can see the big picture when sometimes we can't. That little boy that was going through heart surgery probably is thinking, what in the world are my parents doing to me? And they understood that in order for him to be happy, healthy, and well-adjusted at 17, he needed to go through this procedure. And sometimes we're just like that little baby that doesn't understand what's going on. We don't have a full grasp of the big picture like God does. And the sixth thing, and this is what I hope launches us into our, our study the rest, of the, the rest of this morning, is that evil and suffering or trials can be re reconciled if we recognize its power to draw us to God. 
We've talked about this a ton in our small group over the last probably year. We've talked about sometimes the most dangerous time as a Christian is when everything is just going smoothly. You're heading down the path, everything's going well, your, your bills are paid, there's food on the table, you're getting promoted, your kids are doing well, and you feel like, man, I've really got things under control. And we would never say this, but sometimes in those situations we live like we no longer leave, need God. But man, when stuff gets out of control and we don't have anywhere else to turn and we feel like we're just running into a brick wall and we don't have anywhere else to go, that is when we turn back to God. And I don't know about you, but this pandemic has reminded me of the fact that I have a lot less control than sometimes I would like to believe. And as a result of that, when we're in situations where we get to that realization that we don't have control, we don't have all the answers, we can't do this in our own strength, it draws us back to God. My prayer for you this morning is that is, that is exactly what this situation, or this pandemic, this kind of shared trial that we're all going through can in fact do. We want it to draw us back to God. I have a challenge for families this morning, and, and, and I say families, um, but this is certainly applicable if you are a single person, if you are a, a young married couple that doesn't have any children yet, if you have a young family, if, you're, if your kids are a little bit older, if you're an empty nester, if you're a, an, an older adult who's by themselves, this is applicable to all of us. And it goes back to our life point that we want to make sure that when we come out of this shelter-in-place order, that we have a plan in place that helps us to build our house on the rock of Christ and not on the shifting sand of this world. I want to read to you a scripture out of Mark chapter 12, if you want to turn there. Mark chapter 12, we're going to be in verse 38, or excuse me, 28. And what's happening here is Jesus is debating with some of the religious leaders of the time. It says, one of the teachers of the religious law was standing there listening to the debate. He realized that Jesus had answered well. So he asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this. Now listen, when Jesus says the most important commandment is this, we probably ought to all perk up and listen to what he's about to say. He's about to say something really critical to our faith. And he says, listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. And you must love the Lord your God with all your, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. So Jesus says the greatest commandment is to, first of all, there is only one God. And we need to love that God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. And the, the second commandment is equally important. We need to love our neighbor as ourselves. See, parents, if you have children, you and I are the primary disciplers of our kids. It's not the church's job. It's certainly not the school's job. It's not the grandparents' job. It is our job as parents to disciple our kids. And so it is important that we teach them these things. It is important that we have a specific plan in place that we're going to do in order to make this happen. And again, I'm, I'm talking to families, but don't forget, if, this is, if you don't have kids yet or you've already, your kids are already grown, this is still applicable to you. And I pray that you, you will get something out of this as well. I want to talk to you about a concept this, this morning called family worship. And it's not any kind of magic formula. It's actually very, very simple. And what it does is it involves praying, it involves singing praises, and it involves reading God's word. Pretty simple, praying, singing praises, and reading God's word. Now certainly the stage in life that you're at or the stage in life that your kids are at is gonna vary with how you do this. And what we've got coming out here in the next couple of days is, is Bruce has put together a series of videos to kind of help speak to the different age groups and the different elements of this depending on the age of your kids. But for the sake of this morning, we're gonna talk pretty general. He's gonna give you some more specifics in, in the next few days. I want to start with family prayer, and I want to read to you from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And in, in this, he says, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf, and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority, so they may live a peaceful and quiet life, marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. So one element of this family prayer or of this family worship is family prayer. 
Now, my kids are almost, Kendall's almost nine and Abby's 17. So we get them involved in actually praying for specific things. If your kids are a little bit smaller, you may have to just model for them what that looks like. And like I said, Bruce is going to give you some examples of that. So the first part of this, family worship, is family prayer. The second part is singing songs of praise. Psalms 96, 1 through 2 says, Sing a new song to the Lord. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord. Praise his name. Each day proclaim the good news that he saves. Isaiah says it this way in four, uh, chapter 42, verse 10. Sing a new song to the Lord. Sing his praises from the ends of the earth. Sing all you who sail the seas. Join the chorus, you desert towns. Let the villages of Kedar rejoice. Let all of Selah join and sing for joy. Shout praises from the mountaintops. Let the whole world glorify the Lord. Let it sing praise. So part of your family worship, in addition to prayer, needs to be singing praise songs. Now, the way that we do this in my house may look different than what it is in your house. We don't bring out, break out the hymnals. We turn on YouTube, we, we project it on the big screen TV, and we have six people in our house. And so we do three songs a night, and we take turns of who gets to pick. So you'll hear things like Skillet, you'll hear DC Talk, you'll hear Torn Wells, you'll hear... Um, uh, I'm, I'm kind of naming all the old school ones. My girls know the, the newer ones. Um, but you kind of, you get the idea that we, we get a chance to, to sing praises to God. And it's fun and Kendall's up dancing and we're singing along as a family. But that's part of our family worship. And then the third thing is that you have to read God's word. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes the innermost desires, innermost thoughts and desires. And see, it's, it's okay to read other things. It's okay to read Christian commentary. I actually have a couple of authors that I love to follow. I love to read their stuff. But nothing takes the place of God's word because in Hebrews 4 it says this book is living and active. Even those other good Christian commentaries that you leave, they're different than this book. This book has it, has, can speak right to our hearts because it is the inspired word of God and it is from, it is from him directly. Romans ten seventeen says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you want to increase your personal faith, you want to increase the faith of your child or your children or your spouse, the way that you do that is you, you do that by spending time in God's word. So family worship involves prayer, it involves worship, or it involves singing songs of praise, and it involves reading the Bible. Now, the fourth part of this is when it talks about the second, the second commandment that's of equal importance. Now, for us, when we do our family worship, we typically do it around 8 o'clock at night. We do it before we go to bed. And so this part of loving our neighbors as ourselves is often not part of that family worship time. But it's an important part of your plan. You need to have a part of, as part of your plan a way that you're going to love your neighbor as yourself. We're called to be the hands and feet of Jesus. So it's not just about praising him and learning as much as we can. That's, those are really important things. But then we need to live that out by loving our neighbors as ourselves. Ephesians 5.14, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. James says it this way in, verse, in chapter 1, verse 27, religion that, it, that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So family worship incorporates prayer, singing praises, reading God's word, and loving your neighbor as yourself. Now, my challenge to you is as a family, I want you to put together a plan where you are when we, things get back to normal. So let me, let me give you an example. I'm, I'm, I'm going to share our plan with you. And the reason I'm going to share our plan, number one, is so that maybe you might get an idea and you might go, hey, we could add that to our family worship. And number two, I want you to hold me accountable. I want to be held accountable for this. So in the fall, when life gets busy again, let's, let's assume for a minute that we're going to be back to normal. And we've got two girls running cross country. I've got one girl who's playing volleyball, and I'm coaching football, and we're back into school. I want you to come up to me, and I want you to say, Brock, are you fighting for your family's, uh, for your family's plan of family worship? And are you making time for that? Or have you been consumed by the busyness of this world and you've moved on? So my challenge for you is when you make this plan, if you're part of a small group, I want you to share that with your small group so that, number one, you can give them ideas, but number two, so that they can hold you accountable. If you're not part of a small group, I pray that you'll share it with somebody for those same reasons. So our family plan is going to look something like this. 
we are going to continue to have our girls do their individual devotion time in the morning. It's still really important that they spend time on their own in God's Word, whether that's reading devotion or reading from His Word specifically. We're going to do family worship time. And I told you in the fall it's going to get really busy for us. On Thursday and Friday nights, we're going to have football games on, on those nights. And so from Saturday to Wednesday, our goal as a family is going to be in those five days, we want to have four nights where we have family worship. And we're going to have to fight for that. That's not going to come easily because we're going to be tired, we're going to be busy, but we're going to fight to have that family worship. And I want you to hold me accountable for that. In addition to that family worship, something that's come about as a result of this extra time that we've had is we've started to do a read aloud as a family. Now, I told you my girls are, from, are 9 to 17, and that probably sounds like, oh, they're too old to do a read aloud. Let me tell you, it's been one of the coolest things we've done during this, this shelter-in-place time. We read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and then we watched the movie together as a family. Then we picked up uh, the, the Kids Left Behind series. We're about halfway through the second book, and I'm telling you, we can't wait for the next chapter because we've been left hanging by what's happened so far in the book. And we're planning to, we've watched the, the first Left Behind movie, and we're going to plan to move forward. And then in addition to that, we've watched a, a show called The Chosen, which is one of the things that Elena put out when this all started and we were kind of locked down in our, plate, in our homes. And it is a phenomenal show. And so when we were doing our, our family worship time and we were reading, when we were watching The Chosen, we were reading from the book of John. And we were reading chapters that were going along right with the movie. When we finished that up, I said, all right, girls, what do you want to read next? And Taylor said, well, we're going to start that Left Behind series. What if we read through Revelation? And so we're watching the Right Now Media and the Bible Project, and we're, or the, the Bible Project on Right Now Media about how to read through Revelation. And so we're using that to go along with our read aloud time. And it's just been a, it's been a really fun time. Now, with that being said, I want you to understand that if you choose to do this, you are entering into a spiritual battle. And I guarantee that Satan does not want any part of you and your family praying together, worshiping together, reading God's word together, serving together. And so if you choose to do this, understand that there is going to be a spiritual battle that comes as a result. And so I want to encourage you with the words in Ephesians 6 where he talks about putting on the full armor of God because the battle that we're fighting is not against flesh and blood. It's against spiritual things. And so when you decide to do this and you decide to share that with your small group and you decide to to commit when things get busy and we get out of this shelter in place order that we're in and we can get out and start doing things normal and you won't, you don't want to go back to just having your house built on the sand but you want to build your house on the foundation of Christ by doing this family worship by having a plan and then fighting for that plan that's my prayer for you this morning all right let's go ahead and bow our heads and uh, we'll close with a word of prayer father god we love you so much we thank you that uh, we can come to you that you have a plan for us, uh, that you give us a foundation that we can build our lives on where we don't have to be tossed, and tossed back and forth by every storm or every trial that comes in our life. Help us to fight, help us to make, for this, make this plan and then fight for this plan, Lord, and we know that it's gonna be a spiritual battle. We love you. Uh, we ask for your help in this. Uh, we ask that you would help us to be accountable to each other, that you would help us to, to help other people who are in similar life stages to us to, to, to set up this plan. And Lord, ultimately, we hope that as a result of this, we grow closer to you and we can serve you and serve those around us in a way that would be pleasing and honoring to you. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, church family. I just wanted to give you a brief invite to go check out the videos that I made. Um, I filmed them all in my living room, so I apologize. Um, but that's where we're all at these days. Uh, I hope that you find them helpful. You will be receiving them in an email, but if you're not on the email list or somehow it goes to your spam folder, you can always find them on the Facebook page. So City on a Hill Community Church on Facebook. Uh, you can also find them on our church website. We'll have a link at the homepage, so it should be nice and easy for you to find. Uh, there are four videos, an introduction to family worship, uh, and then the three parts that Brock talked about, family reading, uh, family prayer time, and then family singing. So we hope that's helpful to you. In closing, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Go be the light.